Oh, good afternoon and welcome. So my talk I'm giving today is pen testing experience and how to get it. So I'm Philip Wiley. I have my CISSP, OSCP, and GWPT cert certifications. I'm a security solutions specialist and evangelist at SCI. Uh, I've been working in offensive security for over 10 years. Uh, spent five years in consulting, worked as an internal pen tester, led a red team for a global product, consumer product company. I uh, worked as an instructor. I used to teach at Dallas College. I taught uh, pen testing, web app pen testing there. And I'm also the concept creator and uh, co-author of the pen tester blueprint, which is based on my college, le college lecture from Dallas College, which I gave at the, each, uh, the beginning of each semester, telling my students about pen testing and what it took to get into pen testing. And so by the end of 2018, it turned into a, a uh, conference talk, and I presented that at B-Sides DFW in uh, Dallas, Texas. And it was really kind of cool because when I gave that talk, uh, there were some people from our community. I offered my class as continuing ed and uh, credited because I knew there's a lot of people in the community that wanted to learn to pen test, but they didn't want to have to worry about transferring credits, taking all these prerequisites to get in to the course. So I really had some really cool people from the industry. So when I gave that talk at B-Sides DFW in 2018, some of you may have heard of uh, Juno from InfoSec Twitter. She works for Bishop Fox. She was one of my students, so she sat in on that, that talk. I knew her from the com community, but I recently found out like last year or this year that that's what motivated her to become a pen tester. So she ended up taking my class the next semester, one of my best all-time students, a total rock star. She's part of Cult of the Dead Cow now and, and doing some really cool stuff in the pen testing world. Uh, one of my favorite moments was uh, when I was the, the red team lead at the global consumer products uh, manufacturing company. I had a pen test done. So we did all the network pen testing and red teaming, but we outsourced the web app pen testing. We had uh, different consulting companies do that. So on one of those pen tests, I had uh, Juno and another former student, one of my very first students, were on that pen test. They were working for the consulting company. So to see the email come across them getting ready to start the testing was kind of a, a, a proud uh, teacher moment to see my teachers, my students go on to be pen testers. And kind of a cool fact, most of uh, the people that went through my class that got jobs were, were mainly women that actually got pen testing roles. So there's quite a few in that class that went into pen testing or went into it years later. Uh, I had another student that was a, taking my class, another one of the rock stars like Juno that was a uh, junior in high school and he's taking college classes so he took my pen testing course and now he works at One Password in uh, security research there. He helped create one of the, uh, some of the technologies for the key exchange for their, for their, their app. So it's, it's a lot of fun and I really love mentoring and teaching. I kind of learned in 2018 I've always been very competitive, always trying to be the best pen tester I could be, but in all honesty, I never thought I was the best. I tried to be really good. And then in 2018, I decided to focus on mentoring, teaching, and helping others. So it's been a good change. It's something I'm a lot better at. And one the, at the time when I started that, I thought, you know, the world needs lots of teachers and mentors. And so it's been a fun, fun journey. I've got to meet a lot of uh, people through that. It's been very fulfilling. So I'm also a, a podcaster. So I have a former podcast called The Hacker Factory. There's 118 episodes out there on the podcast platforms, but recently went independent with The Philip Wiley Show. Same, similar format, but I'm also doing video now. Uh, before, it was mainly just geared towards people's stories and advice and getting the industry. But I have different people sharing technologies, and we get into some discussions about content creation, because you'll see in this presentation later on, one of the things I highly recommend when you're trying to break into the industry is content creation. So that's a good way to get noticed, recognized information that you can go beyond your competitors that are applying for that pen testing role to show them some of the things you do that are above and beyond what that role entails. So I always like to share my story of how I got into offensive security. And part of this is to motivate and encourage other people. So when I graduated high school, uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my career. I didn't take high school seriously. I love science, so science was the one class that I would take. I didn't have to study for the exams because I took notes, paid attention, loved it. When I was a kid, I was always checking out science books instead of uh, you know, novels and so forth and fiction. So that's what I was really into. 
when I graduated high school, I didn't take it serious enough. So my grade point average was too low based on my college entrance exam scores. I could have got like eight references from teachers and got into the school, but I just really wasn't into it. Really didn't know what I wanted to do. So being a powerlifter at that time, still still a powerlifter, but uh, back then my my classmates told me, say, why don't you be a pro wrestler? Because where I lived was a big uh, wrestling area in Dallas Fourth area because the Von Erics were very popular there. So I went to wrestling school and so I got married and I had to have a job that had benefits because as a pro wrestler, you don't have life insurance or health insurance. If you get injured, that's out of your pocket. And I wasn't, you know, when you start out, they refer to you as a jobber or a job boy. So I was paid to lose. I was paid to make the superstars look good. I mean, some of the people I wrestled were like Mick Foley, uh, the Rock and Roll Express, the fabulous Freebirds, uh, some of the, the Rock Dwayne Johnson's cousins wrestled as the Samoan SWAT team. And so I had to change jobs. And so I worked in retail sales, tried to go into the military, but for health reasons, I couldn't get in. When I was 15, uh, my brother accidentally shot me. So since I had a bullet in my body, the military wouldn't take me. Either one branch wouldn't take me because of the bullet or other branches wouldn't take me because I was a power lifter and I was too heavy. So I gave up on that. So I tried retail sales, which was probably one of the things I enjoyed the most because working with people. But then I also tried construction, which I absolutely hated. Roofed houses, put up fences. And for me, I've got to have a job that I enjoy. I mean, because my first year out of high school, I had 20, year, 20 jobs my first year, and that's because none of those jobs I liked. So I had to find something I was passionate about. So one day I was home. At this time I was working as a jewelry salesperson at this jewelry store, and I was always like the top, no, top salesperson, either number one or number two. The family that hired me on to work in this store wanted me to be eventually an assistant manager move into management, but the guy that was the manager of the store had someone else that he had considered for that role and they were highly qualified and deserved the job just as much as I do and I understand that. But what I decided is I needed to acquire a skill where I could get a good job regardless of politics. You're gonna have politics everywhere you go or sometimes not even politics, it's just someone thinks this person is another candidate, doesn't mean it's right or wrong. So I knew I had to acquire these skills. So since I was working jobs where I was home during the day, one day on daytime television, they were advertising this trade school that taught CAD drafting. So I liked drawing when I was younger. I took some drafting classes in high school. So I decided to give that a shot. So when I became a CAD drafter, I was exposed to the world of IT. When I went into CAD drafting, I had minimal to no computer skills, probably the worst of my class. By the time I got out of CAD school, got into the field doing drafting, my computer skills surpassed my peers. I would find uh, just different features in the latest version of AutoCAD that my peers that have been drafting longer than me didn't pick up. Windows 95 was fairly new. Uh, I was able to get like Windows 95 printing to work with the Novell network, whereas one of the, the IT people there, that was actually was an accountant that, that did IT because the main IT staff was two hours away, he couldn't figure it out and I did. And it was funny, the first time I ever got called a hacker was because I was working on these systems, but I was trying to get things to work and I was successful. So I decided, because you know the company had, one of the previous companies I worked at, they had a, a consulting company come in and so as a drafter, I was making $15 an hour. We we're being billed out at $30 an hour. So this consultant coming in building you know, $15 an hour, so I knew he was making you know, more money than what I was, and it looked a lot more interesting. So I taught myself how to build computers, took a Novell Network course, and so I worked as a sysadmin for six years. And then in uh, January 2004, I moved into InfoSec, and then about a year and a half later, the company hired a new CISO. The CISO came in, had a better idea of the way security organizations should be run and set up. So fortunately, I got put in the AppSec team. And being on the AppSec team, I got to find out about pen testing. I was managing third-party pen tests. I was performing vulnerability scans with WebInspect and AppScan. And so I really got interested in that. So in 2012, I got laid off from my job and I applied for a role at Verizon as a pen tester, consulting as a pen tester. And one of the things that helped me on that was I had vulnerability scanning experience, some security experience at AppSec, but what really won over the hiring manager is I was self-taught on a lot of things. He was a person that believed in building, not so much learning the hacking stuff. 
if you know how it works, then it's going to be easier to hack into it or secure it. So from that, he took a chance on me. So I went to work there, spent about five years as a consultant, got tired of all the travel and then moved internally. So if you ever get the chance to do consulting, that's a really good way to get a lot of experience pretty quickly. So as an internal resource uh, for a bank I used to work for, we got four weeks to do a pen test, whereas the consultant, we only got one week. So you had to do things quicker. So you're doing so many more pen tests, so many different uh, variety of pen tests, all these different environments, because it's not always the same company. So you're able to pick up a lot of experience quickly. So I went into the internal side, uh, also worked as a, a red team lead for a global consumer product company. And so that's kind of where I got started. And I like to share the story because, you know, you hear of uh, imposter syndrome or lack of confidence. I never thought I would be using my mind for a living. I always thought it'd be the physical because of the pro wrestling. You know, I used to be a pro wrestler and back in my pro wrestling days, I actually wrestled a 750 pound bear. So I never thought I would do that. And so I like to do, one of the things I like to do is encourage people. And that's one of the purposes of my podcast. A lot of times people just need to realize that they can do it. Uh, when you think a good analogy is a sports analogy, you look at any records, Olympic records, running records, uh, distance and time or whatever, or even weightlifting competitions, any kind of sport. Sometimes those records stay there for a very long time, but once someone breaks that record, you notice how all of a sudden it starts getting broken easier? It's because someone proved it could be done. It wasn't because people couldn't do it. It was being proven that it could be done. So that's kind of the purpose of my podcast. And one of the things I hope you take away from this talk is you can do anything you want to. You just have to put your, you know, put your heart into it. If it's something you're passionate about, you put the work in, you will succeed. So kind of just to briefly go over what pen testing is. So it's assessing security from an adversarial perspective using uh, hacker tools and techniques, also sometimes referred to as ethical hacking, but truly ethical hacking is really the hacking part of the pen test. So you can do ethical hacking, not necessarily do a pen test. Uh, but this is some of the terminology that you'll hear. So there's different tools that you need to get experience with. And then also too, you may hear about uh, red teaming and pen testing, there is a distinct difference because real true uh, red teaming is adversary emulation. So you're going in trying to find a foothold in, sometimes it requires social engineering or uh, you know phishing, sending a phishing email to gain a foothold in. So you're looking at one way in, you're trying to go undetected, uh, you try to maintain access, so you're trying to emulate a real world threat actor. So sometimes you'll actually be using uh, some of the things you see on MITRE, you look at some of the APTs and you emulate that. So one of the things you could do is look at popular APTs that affect your industry and base your attacks off of that. With pen testing, you're trying to find every vulnerability that's exploitable and make sure you validate that they're vulnerable and then try to exploit them and exploit anything that'd be exploited to make sure you know what can be done. If it's exploited, anything during post-exploitation, but they're both, both important, so you really want to start out with the pen testing, and as you mature, add in adversary emulation, because you can get really secure, but maybe you're easily social engineered or fished, because some of the phishing tools out there, uh, companies are using less pen testers to do it, they just get some package that sends out these random uh, phishing emails, and what those do, they, they check for clicks, they're not really seeing what happens if someone clicks on that link, you really need to see what happens past that. Can someone get initial access into the organization you know, sometimes it may be really secure, but if someone with the right access clicks on it, then they can get access to the environment. So they're, they're very important. So with the pen testing, you're making sure you're finding all the vulnerabilities, trying to exploit those and document that with the adversary emulation, then you're just trying to see if you could emulate a breach. You're also testing to see if the defenders are able to detect and protect against this. Is the technology protecting against this? So someone clicks on that email, are they able to gain access? So, you, so you're also uh, testing the security. And one of the quotes I like to share with red teaming is the founder of Dallas Hackers Association, Wirefall. Uh, his description of red teaming in his very simplistic form is the red team tests the blue team. So that's a really good thing to keep in perspective for that. So some tools that you need to, to, to get experience with to be a pen tester is vulnerability scanners. So mind you, you still want to learn how to vulner, to manually test for vulnerabilities, but you also want to use vulnerability scanners. So you got network scanners, Nessus, Nexpos, Qualys is another one, not listening there, OpenVos, and Nuclei are free and open source vulnerability scanners. But one of the things with the vulnerability scanners is as a pen tester, you're so limited with time. So you need to be able to do things quicker. Uh, one time there weren't 
vulnerability scanners and what vulnerability scanners have done is help uh, pen testers scale their work. And that's one of the things too that I see coming with AI. I'm really looking forward to some of the tools that AI produces uh, because you look at tools like Metasploit trying to obfuscate your payloads. I can just imagine what, you know, you can do things with chat GPT to do that, but I see some of the next generation tools making that e even easier. So for your web app vulnerability scanners, Web Inspect, AppScan, Acunetics, NetSparker, Nikto, and Nuclei. And so there's also vulnerability scanning capabilities in the commercial version of uh, Burp Suite, the professional version. And then also OWASP's app does some vulnerability scanning. So you need to learn operating systems for pen testing. And also this is a dual purpose. So you need to understand Linux and Windows because most of the environments you're going to encounter will be Windows, Linux, or Mac OS. So understanding how to use those is gonna be very helpful. If you get command on access, also referred to as a shell, to a system, if you know the operating system and how it works, you're gonna be able to, to do a better job because if you have to Google everything, it's gonna take you a long time. So understanding uh, pen testing uh, operating systems such as Kali, Linux, and Windows is gonna help you uh, do a quicker job so you don't wanna have to do all the, all the different, uh, all the Google searches to try to find that. So, Having that as a sysadmin level, so you're able to connect to the, to the network, able to understand basic TCP IP networking and so forth. And so other pen testing tools like Nmap is a very popular one. It's a port and service scanner. There's a lot of really good plugins for uh, Nmap that you can actually, actually function as a vulnerability scanner. Sometimes when the latest vulnerabilities come out, they create a script to look for that. So like Log4j came out, they came out with a NSE script that you could quickly test everything in your environment to see if it's vulnerable. And so Metasploit is an exploit framework. So most of the exploit frameworks don't have a free version, so, but Metasploit is a really good one. Uh, so understanding how to use these tools and then web app pen testing tools like Burp Suite, Zap, and then the web app vulnerability scanners as we mentioned earlier in this slide, and also fuzzers, learning how to use these. So when you're learning how to use these tools, when you're going through a job interview, you're able to discuss that. Because someone may say, ask if you have experience with Burp Suite, Maybe you don't have it professionally, but maybe you've done bug bounty, which that would be professionally. Or if you've done a lab environment, if you're able to answer the questions for that, a lot of times that's, that's, uh, that's good enough. So the skills you need is networking, uh, operating systems as mentioned. You need to know that as a sysadmin level, hacking and pen testing. So when I got into uh, pen testing, this is the piece that I didn't have. I didn't have the hacking piece. I didn't know how to hack. So I took the OSCP certification so reverse engineering is another important one too. So I've seen cases where I've done pen tests for companies and went in and found like a Java jar file and is able to reverse engineer it. And sometimes they have hard coded credentials in there like database connections, username and password. And sometimes this is a way to get in the system. Uh, so being able to reverse engineer is a good thing. And this doesn't take, this take, doesn't take a ton of effort. It's, doesn't, it's not as intimidating as this sounds. Also, you can find some good stuff in, in like APK files for Android apps. Sometimes you may find this on a website. Sometimes you'll find APIs in that. So uh, a tip that I hear from a lot of bug bounty hunters is to look for those APKs, reverse engineering to look for any kind, of, any kind of APIs that are in there. And as far as getting the skills, it depends on what you're wanting to do. So if you have an application background, then application pen testing may be a good route to go. And so this is gonna kind of determine the skills you need, what area you're wanting to pen test. If you have like an ICS, uh, IOT background, then that's gonna be valuable, then understanding that and learning how to pen test those environments. <clears throat> so you need to get the hands-on experience. And what we're gonna cover in this presentation is just actually uh, environments that you can use for educational reasons that help you gain those skills. So mind you, even if it's a lab environment, you write up uh, hack the box or try hack me box, you do a write up on it, do a walkthrough of it, you're able to prove that you're able to use these pen testing tools and that you know how to pen test. And even though you don't have the professional experience, if you can demonstrate that, that goes a long way because you take some people coming in, may have like a CEH or pen test plus, but they really don't know the hacking piece of it. If you're able to just, just you know, able to show people, demonstrate that, then that's gonna help. So some good options there are CTFs, you hear some people that put down the OSCP saying it's CTF-like, but the thing about CTFs, CTFs are not easy. 
sometimes they're not real world scenarios. It could be something more difficult, like going through the OSCP. It could be more difficult than what you would see real world. Uh, but doing hack the box, try hack me, and then creating your own uh, lab using vulnerable VMs is a good way to, to get experience. And so getting that experience, you're able to prove to an employer you know how to perform a pen test, you're able to answer questions during that job interview. And so to get real world experience in professional environments, stuff like bug bounties are great, crowdsource pen testing, these are even better options. So like bug bounties, uh, you're paid per bug you find. And one of the things I like to describe there, if you really get good at bug bounty and stuff like that, you're gonna be a better, a better pen tester because as a pen tester, you're paid for the pen test. If you don't find any vulnerabilities, you still get paid. With a bug hunter, it's like someone that fishes for to feed themselves or fishes for game. It, game. If, so if you're going out there just doing it for fun, if you don't catch a fish, you're still gonna eat that night. But if that's the way you have to feed yourself, you don't, you're gonna get better at it. You're gonna try harder. So these are good ways to learn. And some of the best uh, pen testers I've seen do bug bounties. Uh, bug Crowd, Hacker One, and Synac do bug bounties. But then you have some pen tests as a service, and these are ones I really highly recommend, like Cobalt. So Cobalt is nice because you get paid for the pen test. Last time I heard, it was like $1,500 per pen test. I don't know, we got an expert here, and she validates that that's true. So this is kind of a better option, in my opinion. If Once you get those skills down, you learn how to do a pen test, you, you pass their skills evaluation, then you're on their platform, and you're able to pen test. So you're able to get real world experience. So once you get that real world experience, it's gonna help you to get a role as a pen tester, uh, you know, opposed to not having the experience. So sometimes these are easier barriers to entry. Even like Synac has an online uh, challenge you go through if you got certain certifications, it bumps you up in the interview process. So these are good places to start. And like Bug Crowd and Hacker One doesn't require that you have experience. You just sign up for the platforms and you start off right away. So it's a good way to get practice, but don't get discouraged if you find duplicates because if you find duplicates, that means you're still finding vulnerabilities. So if you're performing a pen test on your own, then you're actually finding actual vulnerabilities. And you can also do pro bono or low cost pen testing for nonprofits or business. You know, a mom and pop business that needs some security work. Maybe you're able to do one for free, a pen test for them for free either that or low cost. So if you're doing it at a low cost, you're getting professional experience. You're actually paid to do it. So there's something there. Maybe it's not that much, but uh, still you're getting something for it. And as you get the experience and build that up, you could actually have your own consulting company and then maybe you get into where you're uh, getting jobs that are paying a, a decent price. But the pro bono work works really well to you because you can find churches, different religious organizations, nonprofits that could use a pen test and you're able to do that for them. And another thing you're doing there when you're doing the pro bono stuff, uh, the security community, people that are involved in the industry, they like to see volunteering and helping out. So that's good to have on your resume. And another one I really like to emphasize too, as far as trying to get experience, is getting common vulnerabilities and exposures, CVEs. So this is one of the things that I see more value in over a certification. Although if you go through the OSCP, it's tough and that proves that you can do a pen test, but finding, a, doing, finding CVEs, you're able to find vulnerabilities that didn't previously exist, which even a vulnerability scanner doesn't find that. So you're able to find CVEs, which is basically kind of like a zero day because no one's discovered it yet, and you're able to document this on your resume or your LinkedIn profile. So really what brought my attention to that is the, the mayor also goes under the, uh, Joe Helley calls himself the mayor. He did a Medium article on one night he was bored and found two CVEs. So basically he was downloading free and open source software for like hotel registration systems, installed it on his home server, did a pen test against it, found vulnerabilities, wrote it up, submitted it, and he got CVEs. And so you can put this on your resume or your LinkedIn profiles and that's gonna help you get that job. You're able actually to find vulnerabilities and these are more difficult to find than uh, you know running a vulnerability scanner or finding stuff that exists. So that's in, in my opinion, that's a, a lot better. So CVEs is basically a database that, that's kept by like MITRE that they keep all these CVE numbers when these CVEs are, are detected. So what you can do with these is you can go in there, take that CVE number, put it on the publication section of your LinkedIn profile so that way people don't have to just trust you that you got the CVE. They can click on that link, they go to the vendor site and they see the CVE, 
the details of the CV and your name associated with it. So some really good articles on that. Uh, Bobby Cook has a uh, article on his blog that's called Beginner's Guide to uh, Zero Day and CV AppSec Research. So if Bobby was going through the OS, OS uh, WE certification through offensive security and said advanced web app pen testing certification. So to prep for that, he was doing some uh, looking for CVEs. And then Joe Helley has his article that his board one night found two CVEs. So if you go to his Medium page, you can find multiple articles. So since he did that, he's done several past that. He does uh, a conference talk on that, that topic. But I think that's a really good way that people overlook. I mean, I, I'm a pen tester. I don't, I've done pen testing for over 10 years and I don't have any CVEs to my name. But I think it's, to me, I would be more impressed with someone with CVEs than a certification. So demonstrating the skills. So you've been going through getting this experience, so how are you gonna demonstrate that? So if writing is your thing, uh, do write-ups. You can do articles, blog posts on GitHub, Medium, or your own blog. And these are things that you can put on your resume, put on your LinkedIn profile, so people can go through if they're looking through your profile, they can see some more in-depth information than just, I've got this certification, I did this or that. You're able to, uh, you know, kind of show people write-ups. So if you find a hack the box that you you did a, uh, were able to solve, you can do a write-up on that or, or you know, and, and keep in mind the different platforms because like Try Hack Me, there's certain boxes they don't want you to re reveal the answers to. So be careful what you're doing that. So you write this up, you can create sample pen test reports, uh, and that way people can see that you can write a pen test report, see the way you think, detail that really well. And also if you, if you are writing scripts that you could put that on your GitHub too as well. And as far as trying to demonstrate those skills, uh, if writing is more of your thing, then gravitate towards that. And the CV, CVE IDs is mentioned, you can put that on your resume or LinkedIn profile. And also tool and tool techniques and walkthroughs on YouTube. So if you like video, then do video walkthroughs. If you don't want your face seen online, you don't have to turn the camera on, just show the screen. So I'd recommend find the platform you're comfortable with because content creation is a great way to get experience and get exposure. We're kind of living in what I would call the golden age of content creation for cyber security professionals. I've seen a lot of cyber security professionals that have started their career based on, they were studying and they were creating videos to kind of show what they were learning in their journey to share with others. And so a hiring manager can see those videos and see your thought process and see your, your hands-on skills and see some proof of that. Uh, so also like scripts or programs that you write that you can put on GitHub. So as far as the content creation, find an area that you're comfortable with. You know, speaking at conferences are another thing. Speaking at meetup groups, there was a recent college grad at our DC uh, 214 meeting in Dallas that had just completed their degree. They were doing like a a talk on malware analysis, and there was a hiring manager from Citibank in the audience, saw that demo, asked for a resume, they basically already had a technical interview, they could uh, vouch for their skills, and so they got an interview with the company and, and then end up getting a job. Uh, so going to these conferences and speaking, doing demos of the stuff is a way to show people not only your, your technical skills, but your soft skills. Uh, a lot of cases you're going to work for a company, you may be presenting, uh, you know, to, uh, clients or if you're, you're doing, you're a pen tester, then you do the debriefing uh, uh, meetings where you read the, the pen test report. So be able to do this stuff is helpful. So uh, you can do video content creation, streaming, YouTube or Instagram, writing, speaking at conferences and cybersecurity meetings. And so professional networking. So this is probably one of the biggest things there. Uh, most of the jobs I got in cybersecurity since 2012, my first job was actually applying for a job, but I think I've only actually applied for jobs that I wasn't recommended for or people didn't reach out to me. So get to know people when you're in, at these conferences, make it an effort to meet people, talk to people. If someone that you may know that you've seen that may have been in the industry for years, don't be as afraid to talk to them because most of them would be happy to help you out. And so just network with people. When you go into your meetups, don't sit in the corner. Uh, if you're Introverted, you know, you're amongst your crowd, you're in your tribe, they understand this. When you, you're talking to people with similar interests, it's a lot easier to talk to. So uh, do that, get, that helps get your name out there. People get to see your skills. Uh, one, one, of the, one of the people from our community had recently graduated from college and a lot of people reached out to me for junior pen testers since I was teaching pen testing. 
And one of the people I knew from our community, I knew they wanted to be a pen tester, so I was able to refer them, and he got his first pen testing job, and that's because I knew him in the community. He talked to people, let them know what he's looking for, so people knew him. If the, he'd just come to the meetups and be quiet, no one would have known, and you know he probably would have missed that opportunity. So there's other opportunities there too, like your online communities like Discord, Slack, Reddit, and so forth, and, and Twitter, whatever they're calling it this week. Uh, I still haven't given up X. Yeah, I really think I could think of other things to call it. You know, he wa- Elon walked in with the sink. He really should have walked in with a toilet because <laughs> that's kind of where it's went. But fortunately, it's doing okay. It's doing okay. It's still a good source. It was really weird to see how many people left Twitter because I used to monitor my follows and unfollows because I really put a lot of effort in my social media. And I noticed at one point I'd lost like four or 500 uh, followers. I looked at this unfollow app and actually the people deleted their accounts, but people are coming back too, so. So those are good, really good places. That's where I get most of my information. InfoSec, Twitter is how I found people in the community. So that concludes the presentation. So if anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to answer your questions. Yes. Okay. So the question was, uh, they're already creating content and asking how to get views. So if you can find anyone to collaborate with, find people that you know have a good following, ask them to to share the content, find people that you can help. We, I'm a member of a Discord, and it's a content creator Discord, and we share for each other. We, so we ask each other, find people to help share that. And if you could ever get someone, you ever have guests on or something, you could collaborate. Maybe someone else that's got a bigger audience, get them on and do that. So really just kind of really sharing on social media. And then maybe if you remember some Discord servers, especially if your content is like cybersecurity content, then find an area that people are trying to break in the industry. They're always looking for, for new content. A good example of someone that built their brand off of beginners is the Cyber Mentor. So he had a lot of information out there to help beginners. And so really also if you're doing this on YouTube, uh, I actually started using TubeBuddy and it gives you some good recommendations on what type of tags to put in to your content. What was that for? Tube Buddy, Tube, like short for YouTube, Tube Buddy. Uh, there's different levels of it. I got the, the lowest level, but it's really helped me increase my SEO and gives you some useful things to, to help you improve the views on that, uh, that particular video. And so also too, when you're, where you're creating that, also put like uh, a call to action. So at the end of it, have like a screen for people to subscribe and maybe even uh, recommend another video or something. That's what's what's kind of helped me out with that. So really, to collaborating with others helps a lot. I was on David Bomble's uh, show a while back, and I picked up like probably about 2,000 new YouTube subscribers. So also kind of being frequent with the content, you know, consistently created. Uh, some of the things I've done to help enhance some of my uh, content for like my podcast is using some of these AI tools. I use a tool called Descript. So it'll write a transcript on that content. So with that, the cool thing about Descript, it'll write, it'll take the transcript, create a transcript for you, create show notes, even create an article. So then you could put, repurpose that on a blog. Not everyone likes videos, so repurpose that on your blog. And so that's a way to get more SEO improvement to your website, get more views to your YouTube channel and stuff like that. So that's been, really great. If you get like the pro version at a, sever- at a certain level, uh, it'll actually uh, give you like short videos and automatically create short videos with the subtitles, like you'll see like an Instagram. And it also creates like audiograms, so short audio clips. So you can take some of that and, and also like creating shorts from your videos. So if you got a 30 minute video, maybe if you can work it out to where you can create like 10 or 20 minute chunks and just take that one specific piece, uh, that's one of the things like David Bomble does, and he's got like two million subscribers. Uh, when I was on his show, he went back and cut it up. So he may have done one thing on recommendations of learning resources or certifications or books, goes back and clips that specifically. And when people go to that shorter form content, maybe that's what they, they recommend. You know, attention spans are getting shorter. And so you have to kind of, uh, you know, like TikTok and Instagram reels and all that, you got to kind of feed that audience. And sometimes it brings you people over to the, the longer content form. Anyone else? Oh, for whoever was first. 
Cool. Hi. How's it going? Uh, I have a question for you. So I'm a system administrator. My guys here are uh, support guys. If you were to give us one thing to do today to get started on our path as pen testers, what would you suggest we do? I know that you had those tools listed there where you can stand up some environments, but what, what's like one thing you would do if we were to go home today okay. that we could start and really get the most experience and the most interest to stay focused on, on this career? So if you hadn't started yet, I would start out with Try Hack Me. Try Hack Me? Yeah, Try Hack Me. Oh, okay. How's that spelled? Try Hack Me. Oh, Try Hack, Hack Me. Yeah, Try oh, Hack okay. Me. Because it's very educational. It's Idea. similar to, they came out after Hack the Box, but they had the educational piece. So it takes you step by step through there. And as you graduate from that, then you can move on to Hack the Box and then Hack the Box Academy. Hack the Box Academy is one of my favorite resources. And if you go to my YouTube channel, I've got like a whole... Uh, semesters worth of lectures on my pen testing class, which was based on the pen test plus certification. So if you go to my YouTube channel, it's just Philip Wiley. Mm -hmm. And so if you go there, I've got, uh, there you go, that make it easier to see how my name's spelled. There but you if you go. go to there, I've got like a whole semester's worth of lectures. And I've known several people that have taken the pen test plus to said that actually helped them on their pen test plus. So getting started and the thing I like about Try Hack Me is it starts out kind of easy and they walk you through it and you actually do the hands-on activities and you'll build up a good base knowledge. So they've got tracks there based on pen testing, like vulnerability management. There's even one that you go through, you're using Nessus in that lab. So it, pre it prevents you from having to build a lab, which is, building a lab is a good thing, but sometimes you can spend more time troubleshooting and fixing a lab than actually doing the hands-on work. Plus the cloud-based stuff, you can do it from anywhere. You can study at work or home or if you travel or whatever. So try hack may be the first step. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question uh, about AI tools. You, you mentioned there was um, AI-powered um, red teaming tools or pen testing tools, and I'm worried that uh, a lot of jobs will be automated out of existence as far as pen testing. So, what particular um, subsections of pen testing are would you say more uh, AI resistant? And um, and what is your take on AI uh, taking over some of the uh, roles? I think it's going to be difficult because one of the things I joke about, and I wouldn't want my manager to hear, but I think I think AI could out could uh, replace management before it could replace pen testers because you know you decide and there's it's more easy to decide until they get really we don't have to worry about much until they get general AI because AI now uses large learning models so you have to train it and feed it information. Once general AI comes around, it can do its own decision learning and all that on its own fine things. But I think really what it's going to do is it's just going to help the tools uh, help automate it, help us automate things. So I would say use things like chat GPT to help you be more effective. One of the, my favorite quotes I've heard is you won't be replaced by AI. You'll be replaced by someone that uses AI. So I think it's, and, and that stuff's really hard. And it's, you know, honestly, because if you look at some of these vulnerability scanners, you know, there's breach and attack simulation tools that will find things that you have to find in the, with your vulnerability scanner and use something else to breach it, to chain that all together, try to find zero days that's going to, you were a long ways from that. Really the more medial jobs it's going to probably replace. Now like your vulnerability scanning is some of the preliminary boring stuff like validating uh, certificate based stuff like that, I think it's going to help in some of those areas and give pen testers more time to focus on the, the hacking piece and more the manual pen testing. So I don't think there's really anything to worry about. I think you should embrace it and learn how to use it in your workflow. Hey, that's been a question before chat GPT became popular that people have been asking for a long time. This isn't really a question, but more of a comment. I've known you for several years and I've seen you take people under your wing and foster them and teach them. And I've seen you literally change lives. So I just wanted to say thank you. Well, thank you. It's an honor. Thank you. It's really an honor because when I started out doing this, like I said earlier, that I turned my focus towards mentoring and teaching and all that. And I never expected anything in return, but my gosh, the the what you get in return just from the satisfaction of helping people is great but i get opportunities for jobs and opportunities to make money all the time that wasn't the intent but it's a nice side effect and i don't know if you're what your religious beliefs are 
I'm a Christian, but I think also if you buy into the universe or whatever, there's some mechanism there, whether we can explain it or not. But if you do good things, good things happen to you. If you're, if you negative all the time, put negative out there, then you're going to return negative. If you're always looking for the negative. That's what you're going to find. But if you're putting positive out there and just helping other people, because you never can't tell these people you mentor could end up being a CISO of a company down the road and you work for them. I've seen a lot of cases where people have been like junior to me and they've went on to be, you know, higher up in company and being highly successful. And one of the things to keep in mind when you're starting out, don't think you're starting too late. You see the pen testers got 10 years. I can show you a lot of people that took less time to get there that are better. So don't worry about time restrictions that you have to be a pen tester for 10 years before you hit, get that level. Cause you have, your natural intelligence to begin with, the amount of work you're willing to put into it, the hard work and time, you know, that will beat out tenure. One of the things I hate to see in, in companies is too many times they focus on tenure, the amount of time you've been there. Maybe you've been there 20 years, but did you bring any value? Are you actually doing your job? Or are you just showing up for a paycheck? You could take some young, uh, passionate, or just a passionate person in general trying to break in that's willing to work put in the time, work circles around everyone else, and those are the people who should be rewarded, not just because you've shown up for work for 20 years. And I mean, there's something to be there. If you're doing your job and you've been here a long time, you deserve it, but that's just kind of my, my thought. We need to change the way we see these things. If you're coming in and doing a good job, you shouldn't be restricted. I mean, for instance, my wife works for a company and they told her a couple years ago, oh, well, you have to be here so long. So-and-so was here so many years, but yet, you know, she's outperforming her teammates like three times or four times the bill rate of them working that hard. And so you really should award people because especially your company and you're making money off of consulting. If they're helping you bill more and be more uh, successful, you should help them out because eventually they're going to leave. And one of the things I tell you when I mentor, if you're somewhere two or three years and you're only getting 3% raise, when you first start out, yeah, you're going to have to start out lower. But at some point, you've got the skills. If you left and went somewhere else, you make more money. So you really need to reward those people to keep them around. If you give someone a career path, uh, get them training, be you know good about giving them raises and stuff, they're going to stick around. There's going to be loyalty. Loyalty is a two-way street. Sometimes companies worry about the loyalty of the employee, but you know that goes both ways. Yes. Hi. Um, so you talked a lot about technical skills. Uh, so what would you suggest to folks who have built up the skills, they're really good pen testers, but they need to work on their writing a little bit. They need to work on their report generation, and I know that sucks, uh, but it's one of the more important parts of being the pen tester because you have to deliver the report. So what are some of the recommendations sure. that you would give for communication? Yeah, one of the things I would do, and this is before I got into pen testing, you know, I went back late in life, well, I, still in my 30s when I went back to school for... Uh, to get my associate's degree, one of the best classes I took it took was an English composition course. So one of the things to do if you're really not good at that, I would recommend uh, going to a community college, taking an English composition course, learn how to write. Another thing is just practice, start writing, just like mentioned writing blogs and stuff. Start working on that. One of the things you can do to get practice too is go through and find some CVEs from like Nessus or whatever. Go back and work on rewriting those vulnerabilities because uh, you know one of the consulting jobs I had some of the vulnerabilities did come directly from Nessus, but I worked at a company I really thought this was a good idea. They went back and created custom write-ups for that CVE so that way it doesn't look like a Nessus report. So maybe go through, find some different CVEs and reword it or practice writing executive summaries. Say if you did you know, a pen test or you did hack the box or something, write a pen test report. So the best way to get experience with writing is writing. So if you really need a lot of help, then do you know, take a course, English composition course, and also using tools to help with your grammar and stuff. And one of the things too, you'll find out some of these tools are not foolproof. I use Grammarly a lot and sometimes it's incorrect, but just practice writing or take a course to help, help with your writing. And one of the things I'd advise too with writing pen test reports, if you, I found a better experience if I try to enjoy it. If I try to not only just show some company how bad you hack them, but look at it as more of a way, this is how thoroughly I tested you. You may come back and not be, not find a bunch of findings, but if you can go through and say, this is what all I did and really explain that in depth, that way they're gonna see that they've got a quality pen test, even though maybe you didn't find a lot of things, but yeah. So that's one of the things, every time I found that I tried to enjoy writing the report, it was a lot better experience. Take pride in it, 
uh, really, you know, work hard to create a good report. And that's been one of the better experiences that I've had. I told you. You know, when you, when you wrestled, what name did you go by? I just went under Phil Wiley because at first you have to lose all the time and I didn't want to ruin my gimmick. Although I, names I'd considered, one name I'd considered was Phil Ferrari because I like Ferraris. This is back in the 80s. Uh, Miami Vice, you know, they had a, a Ferrari on there, Magnum PI. Uh, but I did wrestle in Florida once like, under the, the name uh, Corporal Chaos. So I painted my, my face with camouflage makeup and all this. So I did that one time. But yeah, I just went under my own name because, like I said, you have to lose all the time. It's really funny the way wrestling works because I was the guy that had to lose all the time. And there's one time that they did some, they had some storyline that they were working where this one bad guy turned good guy and the fans were really starting to get behind him. And I never really got cheered when I went to the ring because I was nobody, but he was getting beat up. So I went in to try to help him and I get beat up too. And so after that, for about a month, people would cheer for me coming to the ring <laughs> because I tried to help their, their, their hero or the star. Uh, hi, I'm over here. Yes. Um, so you mentioned InfoSec Twitter, which is something that I've recommended for years uh, for people like just getting into um, security. But uh, there was a data scientist that posted, I think, like a week or two ago, a little while ago, um, about uh, how InfoSec Twitter has actually dropped 87% since the day before Elon Musk took over. Um, and so I, I've noticed a big drop in the amount of like learning material and connection points in there. And I know that a lot of people are, have gone to Mastodon, but there's also things like Blue Sky and Discord, but there's not really a centralized place anymore like there was with uh, InfoSec Twitter. Um, I guess I'm wondering is, uh, is there any place that you think, any, any social outside of Twitter um, that you could point someone to that is looking for a communi community of learners? I think you just really have to get on several of them because everyone was going to Mastodon. And so several of us from like our Dallas uh, DFW hacker community went over to, to Mastodon several years ago, but it just really never did seem to catch on much. But my opinion is to get on Mastodon, get on Threads, get on Blue Sky, and just kind of see which one benefits you the best but I do see that Twitter has been coming back, which is because all of a sudden I was I used to pick up like a hundred, couple hundred uh, followers pretty, pretty consistently. And then all of a sudden that big drop and it really dropped off. And then over the past couple months, I've seen a higher uptick, you know, I gained like 500 uh, followers like a couple weeks ago. So it's kind of getting better. But I would say just get on the different platforms. I don't know if if Twitter is going to tank, but I think it's a good idea to look into other platforms in case Twitter goes under and really don't underestimate like LinkedIn. So if you know these other people from these other platforms, follow them on LinkedIn. That's one platform I don't see going away for a long time. So I'd say uh, put a lot of effort in there. A lot of people are starting to put more effort into LinkedIn because they're worried about uh, Twitter. So my question is, you know, the, the recommendations and the how you set yourself up and everything like that, is there any difference between the goal being more of the contractor, consulting, do-it-yourself, get hired for a specific job version versus the in-house, do it for a company on their product full-time pen testing? I guess that's all going to depend on your risk. If you want to go into business for yourself, you could do that. And I've seen several people do that. If people know you're pen testing, they may come to you because you may be less expensive than some of the big consulting companies. Contracting is a good way. I think sometimes contracting is probably easier to get into than a full-time W-2 uh, pen testing role. Plus, you can use multiple companies to contract through. So I know people that'll contract for multiple companies, and sometimes you pay out. It pays better, but sometimes you don't get the benefits. But one of the things is once you get the experience, then you can go pretty much anywhere you want to starting out and some of the contract roles pay pay pretty decent because i know several of those you can find around 100 bucks an hour or so and so yeah it just depends on what you want to do if you like being in business for yourself contract maybe what you do there and i've uh and one of the things i've constantly had people reach out to me knowing i'm a pen tester asking me if i was inter interested in doing work so 
once you kind of establish, establish yourself, then people may reach out to you for that work or just you know connect with people in your local community because not everyone has the $250 or $300 an hour to pay an organization, but maybe you're doing it on your own. You could charge 150 bucks an hour. They're still coming out cheaper and then you're able to, to make pretty good money that way. All right, I did a, I failed at keeping us on time. So, uh, and we gotta get ready for the next talk. So one more question, raise your hand if you have not already asked a question. All right. And if you have questions after this, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you.